Welcome and thank you for joining this webinar in the COVID-19 and humanitarian settings, exploring the controversial issue series produced by the Ready Initiative, the Johns Hopkins Center for Human. Medicine and the Geneva Encourage participants using the Q&A feature directly in Zoom. Some of these questions will be addressed in the Q&A I'll discuss. Access to today's recording will be available after the webinar at readyinitiative.org and on the websites of the three universities. We also encourage you to COVID-19 humanitarian platform at www.covid19humanitarian.com, which curates, analyzes, and interprets guidelines and interventions being implemented in a variety of humanitarian settings to prepare for, respond, and adapt to COVID-19. The platform also has a COVID-19 humanitarian tracker with real-time data for affected countries. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Professor of Practice at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health, Dr. Paul Spiegel. Hi, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. And thank you, Ryan, for, uh, for introducing and ready for helping us to put this together. So we're thrilled to have uh, all of you today. The, the topic is why is COVID-19 not transmitting in humanitarian settings as expected, or is it? Um, we currently really don't have a good understanding of how the novel coronavirus is being transmitted in these settings and what are the effects of COVID-19. It was assumed that given crowded conditions, poor hygiene and baseline levels of health, that non-pharmaceutical interventions would be more difficult to implement and that hospitals with limited to no ICU capacity would be quickly overwhelmed. However, this does not appear to be happening or at least has not been reported in such a way. So we're here to discuss these questions. Um, we're going to start now with a very, very brief poll. So Ryan, if you would please put the poll on and then if uh, the participants can um, please just answer either agree, not agree, don't agree or um, unsure. And then we're going to do this again after we, um, after we speak. So please go ahead and do that and submit your questions. I'm sorry, submit your answers. And while we're doing that, I'll just briefly explain. So this is going to be, it really is going to be a panel and a discussion. We're not going to have PowerPoints. Um, what we've done is I'll introduce our, our panelists um, sequentially, as just a very brief uh, introduction of who they are, give a brief context, and then answer some, uh, and, and ask them some questions. Each of them will have five minutes to respond. And then once that's done, we will interact amongst ourselves for about uh, eight or so minutes. And then during this time, we'll be taking questions um, and uh, Kiara will be collating them and then um, I'll be asking the panel. So Ryan, I don't know if you are able to, I haven't seen yet to show the results. Okay. So at the beginning of this, 22% agree that it's high, 23% disagree and 54% are unsure. And we will be curious at the end to see if that changes at all. So I'm going to start now. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, Altaf Musani, who is the, currently the WHO representative for Yemen. Um, it's been a pleasure. I've known Altaf for many, many years. Um, he's worked for WHO and humanitarian emergencies in numerous countries, including Afghanistan, um, Iraq. He was the, the, the WHO representative in Iraq. Pakistan, and of course now Yemen since 1999. And he previously worked with IMC in the field and uh, CDC. So Altaf, um, according to the WHO Yemen dashboard, as of yesterday, there were 2,056 confirmed cases and 597 deaths in Yemen. Yet it's been reported that grave diggers and aid in other cities have been overwhelmed this summer. And uh, Francesco Kecki of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine testified in the UK, and I quote, the anecdotal reports for getting inside Yemen are pretty consistent that the epidemic has quote unquote passed. There was a peak in May and June across Yemen where hospitalization uh, facilities were being overwhelmed. That's no longer the case. 
So to start with, uh, I'll talk, the question is I have for you is number one, what data are, are actually being collected in Yemen and how confident are you in its quality and representativeness? And then finally, what would need to be done better to get a better grip or understanding of what's happening with COVID in Yemen? Over to you. Thank you, Paul. And it's a pleasure to see you as well as the other panelists. Let me just start by making one or two introductory remarks that Yemen um, uniquely, like other uh, humanitarian situations, was very bad prior to COVID. So our benchmark of measure is obviously before COVID and, and now with COVID. Um, unlike other humanitarian sit settings, Yemen happens to be the world's largest humanitarian operation, not only in terms of the humanitarian footprint, but more so the humanitarian needs in Yemen. And this is roughly 24, Yemen, 24 million Yemenis that require some form of assistance um, collectively. And so we were already heading into an environment of COVID where we were very dire in terms of our operational footprint, our ability to provide direct access for food, water, and healthcare. Um, and so the COVID overlay was a deep concern. And in fact, um, Mark Lowcock, the ERC of OCHA, had advocated this very loudly during several Security Council briefs saying that no, no more aware in, in a country such as Yemen this will be um, the, the virus of COVID-19 be widely spread, deadlier consequences um, and impact humanitarians capability and more so the health authorities to be able to respond. Um, and so to that effect, the data part of our ability to understand what COVID would do, we obviously embarked on, on several modelers um, to be able to give us some planning horizons. Um, this was not only used for, for planning purposes, but more so to piece together a very fragmented plan uh, presented by the different authorities throughout the country to say, where do we think um, you know, our operational capabilities for, for response are? Um, and I think as you cited very clearly, when you look at our dashboard and reminding everybody that the obligation to report, it relies on the member states through the international health regulations, we depend on health authorities to be able to give us that data. And you're absolutely right. That 2000 plus data represents a number of issues. One, a grossly underestimation of what's really happened with COVID-19. Two, it's a, it's a segment of the COVID cases which are targeting the severe and critical. Three, it is more of a reflection of the data that is being pulled disproportionately from the South rather than the North. And absolutely, I mean, we've relied heavily, not only in the data parameters to see where we are on the curve, but more so to be able the population. It was, it's really important for us to be able to invoke some type of behavioral change, whether it's the protective measures against uh, uh, the populations use, the mask wearing, the physical distancing, or actually seeking health care. I mean, again, and I revert back to, you know, pre-COVID times when health seeking uh, behavior was very different throughout the country. So you're absolutely right. We've used additional measures such as social media. We've, we've talked to the healthcare workforce. We've looked at hospital uh, admission data uh, to be able to piece together our data issues. Okay, thank you. What, what other, so do you have a different, in terms of your data currently, are there other, um, beyond just on the dashboard, do you have other um, data to show that there has been a significant amount of at least transmission in Yemen? So being the largest humanitarian operation, there are several data parameters that we use to piece together the humanitarian environment. And it's, you know, smart surveys, nutritional survey, hospital admission. A lot of it is um, by proxy. Um, we do collect primary data, but the difficulty by and large has been for the authorities to report directly COVID, critical, severe, asymptomatic, mild and moderate. So we know that we're very far off the curve um, and one of the things that we're looking forward to going into, um, you know, our preparations for waves two and three is how do we now recenter those data parameters, go beyond the south from the critical and the severe cases. And we're working with several institutions through seroprevalence coverage surveys, as well as direct targeting of the mild and moderate cases to really look um, at, at caseloads that might be attributed. And I think, you know, co-infection comorbidity patterns are critical and Emin, um, you cited very clearly that there was high case fatality rate. We didn't know that was um, attributed to dengue, malaria. In the initial days in the South, there was a lot of confusion of a viral hemorrhagic fever being the plague. And then obviously the plague overshadowing what was really happening with COVID. So we don't really have new systems online, but we are going to try and really you know, push the authorities to take existing surveillance 
existing hospital administration data. But again, it's important to understand that this is all happening uh, within the context, not only humanitarian environment, but the act of war. And so we've gone from 30 to 45 front lines within a six month period. And it's very difficult to collect that type of data on front lines. Thank you. Um, we won't have time now, but in the, in the further discussion, I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, your plan or what's feasible given the political complications and issues uh, in trying to collect data from the north or get, get data from the north. So we're going to now move to, uh, to Dr. Sandra Harless, who's a senior public health officer at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. She's currently in Cox Bazar in Bangladesh. Sandra has more than 18 years of experience working as a public health specialist in many different countries in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And she's worked with UNHCR for the last six years, as I mentioned, currently in Bangladesh, where she's the health and nutrition team leader as the senior public health officer. Sandra, wonderful to have you. Um, given your, your experience in Cox's Bazaar, I think at least over the last two years, if I'm not mistaken, I'd like to first ask you about the Rohingya setting situation, but then move on to some other refugee settings globally. So as of yesterday, just like with Yemen, I went on to the, the WHO, um, WHO dashboard, and they said that, that there, it reported there were 12,143 tests amongst the Rohingya, but only 277 confirmed in eight deaths. Now this is a, a test positivity rate of 2.3% for the refugees, compared with 14% in the surrounding host populations in Cox Bazar. And similarly, the, the infection mortality rate is only 0.07% for refugees, but more than doubled 0.2% for the host populations. Why do you believe this is, is the case? And do you, what do you actually believe is happening um, in these uh, refugee camps with respect to COVID transmission and death, number one? And then number two is beyond Bangladesh, um, again, to a lot, to many of our surprise, um, it doesn't appear that COVID in both refugee settings outside and inside of camps has been having a, a major, at least we're not aware of the transmission and certainly numbers of deaths. So what do you believe are some of the possible reasons for these no numbers of reported cases and deaths? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and thanks for having me here. I I hope you can hear me clearly. We just have a massive rain shower starting here. <laughs> so it might be a little bit noisy in the background. Apologies for that. That's uh, Cox Bazar realities. So let me start with the situation in the Rohingya refugee camps. So with regards to the different positivity rates that you mentioned, when we compare the access to testing in the camps to the host community, it is comparatively easier in the camps. We do have 22 testing sites there. And um, in the host community, the testing is more more concentrated in larger towns. And in addition, we also use uh, in the camps a, test, a sentinel testing approach. So we don't um, necessarily test only those that strictly meet the WHO case definitions, but we really look also for a wider segment of the population to see, especially if there are many asymptomatic cases or mild cases that might have otherwise gone unnoticed. Huh? So so when we look at the actual case fatality rates among the refugees in the host community, it is a bit higher in the refugee camps than it is in the surrounding host communities. But as you rightly said, the, we have very few cases so far in the camps and few mortalities. So that might also change uh, over time. Um, what I think is very likely that the actual number of persons being infected with COVID in the camps is higher than what is being recorded. We had, especially in the early phase, uh, rumors around COVID and around the Sari ITCs that prevented many people from seeking testing and care. So this has been reversed after a lot of interventions, a lot of awareness raising campaigns and door to door visits. But we still think that not everybody is coming forward who needs testing. And also the, re the referral to the testing sites um, is still an area that can be further improved. Um. What we have seen in the last couple of weeks, um, in September especially, we have seen a, a rise in ARI patients for general consultations. That is about 40% more ARI cases than we had in the same time last year. And at the same time, we had also seen an increase in COVID-confirmed patients. So when the ARI 
consultations peaked, um, we also saw then the ca COVID cases going down. So it's quite possible that this could have been a wave of uh, COVID infections with many cases being mild and asymptomatic, but we just uh, don't have a confirmation. So there is a zero prevalence study planned by WHO uh, it, within a month that will hopefully give us more clarity on what actually the situation is and where we are in the epidemic. Uh, talking about mortalities, uh, we do have quite a robust system of community-based surveillance that covers all the camps. We have around 1,500 CHWs um, that are dedicated, uh, that have dedicated reporting areas and report weekly. So we did see a, a bit of an increase in mortalities in June. We didn't see an increase now in September. And when we compare the rates to, to last year, they are actually quite comparable. We don't really see significantly more mortalities in the camps. There have been some reports uh, that suggested that deaths might be hidden in the community in large numbers. And we did do additional investigations uh, with WHO colleagues um, to, to dig further in our data. And I think we all do recognize that the community-based systems do have their limitations and that there may be cases that are hidden in the community but we also believe that we would have seen if there would have been a large increase in hidden deaths that we would have uh, picked those up through the various other uh, avenues for reporting um, we also did not see any significant numbers of severe forms of uh, COVID um, which we would expect if there is a high number of uh, mortalities we would expect that at least a certain percentage of the persons would come forward to seek treatment, even if not everybody would uh, perhaps seek uh, care in the facilities. So, so in summary, on the refugee Rohingya refugees, I do believe that there are more uh, more cases in the community, but also that many are mild and asymptomatic cases actually. And what you mentioned in other refugee operations, we also see similar low rates of reported cases and deaths. Uh, there are a few factors that the Rohingya refugee camps and other refugee camps worldwide have in common that might, might contribute to lower infection and mortality rates. Um, the camps, for one, are tightly controlled areas, usually with tightly controlled uh, access, and that has been further strengthened uh, and also restricted with COVID, um, with the COVID infection starting. So UNHCR, in cooperation with especially WHO and many other health partners, we do have uh, established surveillance systems in the camps. We have early alerts and alert investigations, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine facilities in combination with awareness campaigns and physical distancing measures. And I think we have to recognize that in a closed setting like a camp, this is easier to implement than let's say perhaps a, a slum area where infections spread more quickly and people go easily in and out. Um, the camps also have, uh, in that sense, the advantage that services are provided in the camp, healthcare, food services. So there is less mixing of people going in and out. In the same time, we also have to recognize that the, the testing really varies. I think in Cox Bazar, we're in a lucky position that we do have uh, good PCR capacities. That's not the same necessarily in other uh, refugee operations. And then we look, for example, in the South Sudanese refugees in Ethiopia, there is much less testing uh, being done among the refugees than among the, the host communities. So these are often perceptions that Refugees have better access, but it's very really varies a lot from different uh, camp settings to camp settings. And perhaps just a last factor to mention: refugee populations also tend to be younger uh, populations with less comorbidities, especially in the early phases of displacement, which could also be a factor on why we see less uh, cases or less severe forms and mortalities in the camps. So I'll stop here, but I'm more than happy to take questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, it is indeed um, indeed interesting to see, um, even though we, we may not know yet, in pulse, we have serial surveys, the actual amount of transmission, um, the death rates are really, really low in these settings and lower than would have been surmised, let's say, compared to other settings, which will, which brings me to, to Sean Trulove. So, um, Dr. Sean Trulove, an assistant scientist in the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And Sean's work focuses on infectious disease epi epidemiology and disease dynamics and modeling. 
Um, as part of the Centre for Humanitarian Health, we led a co-led initiative uh, to provide uh, SARS-CoV-2 modelling and epidemiology support to humanitarian partners, including UNHCR, OCHA, and MSF. So, Sean, um, thank you, of course, for for being here. You've heard, uh, and I know you've you've been looking particularly uh, in amongst in the Rohingya setting. Um, but what we're seeing is that early on, you know, it was noted that the proportions of deaths in your in the models that came out. Um, the transmission was seen to be very high, and the proportion of deaths was lower in these settings for what Sandra met because of what Sandra mentioned, mostly a very low demographic, a high, high percentage of children and um, lower percentage of people over 60. Yet still, the, the models did, I think, understandably predict a significant increase in excess mortality that we don't appear to be seeing. Why do you believe this is the case? And this was, if I may say, this was similar in other refugee and IDP settings. So why do you believe this is the case? And what type of information do you believe is needed to make models more relevant to the actors in the field? Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here and talk about all this. So I guess this, is, this has been a real surprise kind of across the board. Um, I guess it's a happy surprise. Uh, we did expect much uh, more severe outcomes among these settings, um, and not just humanitarian settings, but also uh, among LMICs, including many countries in Africa. Um, but I think generally speaking, uh, it's, this has kind of occurred through a combination of an overestimation of severe outcomes and potentially an overestimation of the amount of transmission that would occur. Um, as well as the substantial underreporting and underdetection in uh, these settings. And it, it has made it, it appear that these populations have been largely spared, though I don't know that that's um, necessarily the case in terms of uh, actual transmission and infection. And so from the side of modeling um, and our early projections, uh, I guess it's important to note that these were really early on. Uh, we were using data that were being collected and provided through uh, populations like China, uh, some European populations that not, were not necessarily representative of these populations. And so a lot of our, our understanding and estimates early on of how severe an, an individual case could be and what the probability of them becoming a severe case or becoming hospitalized or dying really came from those populations. Um, and, but it also, uh, it came from very small studies and s small sets of people for which uh, we really didn't have a full picture. We were relying heavily on, on these populations of very few individuals where we uh, were hoping every single person was tested and tested appropriately via RT-PCR, um, but that has its limitations. Uh, particularly because we don't, it doesn't tell us everything about uh, the whole history of an in individual's in infection, um, where a, an individual may not test positive via RT-PCR early in their infection or late in their infection. Um, and so uh, this really gave us, a, uh, I think, an overestimate of how severe uh, infection might be in a lot of these populations. Um, and then that resulted in us overestimating the probability of death or of hospitalization in, in these humanitarian populations. So I think that, um, that really contributed to some of this over, over projection and overestimation of the impact in these populations, but that's not all of it. Um, really a large part of it is that we, we just don't have enough uh, information and consistent information about uh, who is being infected through testing. Um, and some of the testing has been inconsistent. And so that's made uh, it difficult from the perspective of modeling to uh, try to capture some of these, these trends and these behaviors in order to really represent what's happened or what's been happening. Um, and so while I agree uh, with Sandra, that um, the uh, severity has not been seen. Um, I think it's unlikely that transmission has really been controlled in these settings. We, we know that, as she mentioned, slums in India uh, and other places, 
where seroprevalence rates have been extremely high, where we thought previously that transmission was not occurring. And it's very possibly that this is a similar situation in these, in these uh, refugee settings, where there's a lot of transmission occurring, but because of uh, the amount of asymptomatic and very low uh, severity, we're just not seeing it. People aren't seeking care. Um, and really, I think what we need to, like for, for us from the, pers from the side of modeling, to improve this for the future, we really need to think carefully about how to deal with sparse data like this in these contexts. And this is not a new problem, um, but I think it brings to light just how uh, early on in, in situations like this, we need to um, be careful and uh, consistent with how we, we collect these data and report these data. Sean, let me ask you briefly, and then we'll move to Maria, but why, um, if there has been high, possibly, and I would agree that there'd be high transmission in many of these settings, why are we seeing uh, so few severe cases, at least uh, being reported severe cases and limited deaths? So, yeah, and I think it's a combination of things, right? I think, you know, there's some anecdotal qualitative uh, sources of data, uh, such as in the, among the Rohingya population, the ACAPS report that came out that indicate that there has been almost a systematic effort on the part of the population there uh, to not report uh, and not seek care or testing uh, by the Rohingya for uh, COVID-19 due to some of the issues there. Um, and so that may be contributing to it. Um, and I think, as you mentioned about Yemen, um, with bury burials being overwhelming, uh, the cemeteries there. there. So there may be deaths occurring that it just aren't being reported and captured. But again, I also think that we really thought that uh, severity was going to be higher uh, in these populations. And that's really what has led to a lot of the projections being high. Um, whereas we're seeing from some of these, uh, I think, so there was a, a recent report from Bangladesh and they found that among uh, those people who were tested, uh, who tested positive for current infection, 82% of them were asymptomatic. And so it may be that we have a differential rate of uh, asymptomatic infection among these populations as well that we just, uh, we didn't see among populations in the US, Europe, and China early on. And so when we took those data and we took those estimates and applied them, uh, that really led us to thinking we were gonna have a different situation than we ended up having. Okay, thank you. A lot to discuss. Um, lots of other potential factors as well that maybe will come up in our discussion and I'm doing my best to read a little bit what others are. Um, putting into the chat and the, uh, the Q&A. So we'll move now to the, um, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhol, who is WHO's COVID-19 technical lead and head of emerging diseases and zoonoses at, uh, at WHO in Geneva. Maria is an infectious disease epidemiologist and she has a background in high threat pathogens, pathogens and specializes in emerging infectious diseases. So Maria, again, like everyone, thank you for, for coming. For a variety of reasons that the, the panelists have mentioned and even more that will be discussed, um, we really don't have a, a good idea, I think, in humanitarian settings of what both the spread and the, the effects of COVID-19. And one of the only ways to do this will be through, through likely through serial surveys. My understanding is that there have been numerous serial surveys undertaken globally thus far, but of varying quality. Um, some have occurred in fragile settings, such as Libya and Afghanistan, and we've also been looking, as, as Sean and Sandra mentioned, at some of the um, serial surveys that have occurred in slums because of the, the high density and relative poverty may be um, similar to a refugee or IVP camp setting. So, for example, one of the studies, and I, I don't know the quality of this yet, but uh, some of the slums in Mumbai in July were found to have a 57% zero prevalence amongst slum dwellers compared to 16% amongst the non-slum dwellers. And then just, I think, yesterday or the day before, an IEDCR survey in Dhaka in Bangladesh was released that found 45% of people were zero positive in the capital. Again, at this point, I can't comment on, on the quality of it. 
Um, but WHO talked recently about uh, an average globally of about 10% of people that have, uh, that have antibodies for, um, um, for the virus. So my question to you is, well, well, many other studies have, many studies have not yet been published. And as we mentioned, varying quality. Can you discuss some of the general findings of the higher quality seroprevalence surveys and how they may or not be applicable in humanitarian contexts? Um, and then finally, as Sandra mentioned, there is going to be a serial survey uh, led by WHO amongst the Rohingya and I think Cox's Bazaar itself, um, surrounding coastal populations in the next few months. But are there, do you, are you aware of any other serial surveys that are planned in humanitarian settings? Thanks, Paul, um, and hello to everybody. Um, that's quite a few questions in, in one. But yes, indeed, um, seroprevalence studies are very helpful to help us understand the extent of infection in populations um, as measured by antibodies. And I think everybody is well aware that in the beginning of any epidemic, any pandemic, our surveillance tends to focus on severe patients uh, and is based on PCR testing. And that's typical. It's, it's what one would expect because this is, these are the individuals who show up at healthcare, who are identified, and who are tested. Um, and as testing capacity increases, um, as surveillance expands, we tend to pick up people on the more mild end of the spectrum, but it doesn't capture the full extent of infection. So we use seroepidemiology, um, and those of us in infectious disease epidemiology have been trying to standardize the approach for seroepidemiology for more than a decade, um, starting with influenza, where we, where we need these types of global estimates to be able to compare countries um, using similar methodologies. Um, and we have um, outlined a number of protocols to standardize the approach in terms of the methods that are used to collect data. Uh, we have six protocols that are available um, to do this. Some of these are population-based studies. And these are the studies that will be carried out in, in Bangladesh and also in Yemen uh, in the coming months. Um, and so that is something, we don't have the results of those yet, but this is using a standardized approach. This is using a, a, a similar assay, so we can have almost apples to apples comparison. Having said that, um, WHO is also tracking all of the seroepidemiology studies that are occurring globally. Um, and so there are more than 158 studies that have results to date 10 months into a pandemic, which is pretty phenomenal uh, given that we're in a global pandemic, um, given that people are able to carry these out. They are of varying quality, these studies. Um, many of them are preprint, so they have not gone through peer review. About 70 of them have actually gone through peer review, and then there are a number of government reports as well. Um, they tend to focus on different populations. Some of them are uh, population-based seroprevalence studies. Some of them are focused on um, essential workers, health workers, frontline workers. Some are focused on um, high intensity transmission areas. Um, some are focused on um, slums, as you point out. Um, very few are occurring in humanitarian settings at the moment, but we're trying to change that and we're trying to work with countries to be able to do that. And you said in your intro that these are WHO-led studies, and in fact, these are country-led studies. WHO is supporting these studies to be conducted by researchers, by ministries, by partners in country um, to build that research capacity and so that they own those results and those results get fed into the response itself. Um, what we know globally uh, about the studies um, this is a huge overgeneralization because of all the limitations with the results that we have so far, the assays that are used, the timing of the data collection, the populations under study. Um, and out of these 158 studies, the vast majority um, have seroprevalence results under 10%, some well under 10%. There are exceptions. Uh, the exceptions are frontline workers, health workers, uh, where we see seroprevalence in the 20-25%. Um, there are some studies in slums, uh, in, in areas uh, in Argentina, um, in, in India, uh, finding above 50%. Many of these are using RDTs, so rapid diagnostic antibody tests. Um, the quality of those tests are not uh, great. Um, they give an indication. They do help us understand. They give an indication. But what we would ideally like are neutralizing antibody tests which of course you need a specialized lab to be able to do so. There are some higher performing ELISA tests um, that can be done in many countries and that's the ones WHO is focusing on and actually providing those tests of the countries that we are supporting. Um, so there's varying range in terms of what we understand. But this makes sense uh, if you think about it because this virus uh, needs close contact to spread. 
Um, this tells us that in situations, if the virus enters, and I think this is the critical factor, and Sandra pointed this out, in the settings where you have closed settings or there's limited mixing, uh, uh, limited introduction, uh, if the virus were to enter into that situation and spread like wildfire, um, it's very, very difficult to control. Um, and you may have younger populations, uh, you may have uh, fewer underlying conditions, but it is very difficult to hide deaths. Um, if you have individuals who have underlying conditions, if you have individuals who are above 60 years old, we know globally that people have a higher uh, risk of death if you're in those categories. Um, so I think there's a number of things that are happening. Um, as you pointed out, we do have um, the studies. Uh, these are done under our heading of these called unity studies, which are using the WHO core protocols. Uh, we're providing technical support, operational support, financial support um, to carry these out um, using a standardized approach. And in Yemen and in Cox's Bazaar, it'll be a population-based zero survey. Um, which will have a, a few thousand individuals enrolled in these and using the, the, the assays that we provide. We don't have the results of those yet. So, you know, your answer to your question of do we know, um, we really need to wait for those results. But I do think globally, we do see that the range of the detected to unrecognized is about 1 to 10, 1 to 12. So for every case that we detect for PCR, we're missing about 10 or 12 unrecognized. And I don't say asymptomatic, and I do that on purpose because a seroprevalent, someone who has antibodies um, and wasn't detected through normal surveillance doesn't necessarily mean they were asymptomatic. It means they were unrecognized. Um, and I do think we have a, a large proportion of people who may be asymptomatic, but I, I hesitate to even use the word because on, most of the time when I hear asymptomatic, you ask for a definition, they say, well, not COVID specific symptoms. I say, well, what do you use for COVID specific symptoms? Because they, they range so broadly fever, cough, uh, shortness of breath, but we know many people have very, very mild symptoms. So I think we do need to be careful about the use of the word asymptomatic. And if you look across the Middle East, if you look at just surveillance using PCR, there's large proportions that are mild or asymptomatic, but that has to do with screening. So I think, um, you know, there are certainly unrecognized cases. I think ser epidemiology is an incredible tool uh, that can help us really understand um, the spread uh, of this virus, um, but in situations where you have close proximity to one another, the key for us is to prevent the introduction. Uh, and if it is introduced, to make sure you have those systems in place to deal with it. I am struck by the capabilities uh, and the resilience of populations in Yemen and in, in, in Cox's Bazaar. I mean, Sandra outlined and Altaf outlined all of the systems that are in place for surveillance, for case detection, for, for um, seeking care, for testing services, um, which many high income countries are not actually able to do. So I do think that the systems that are in place um, are serving them well. Um, I think there's a lot more that we need to be able to do, um, but let's see what comes out from these zero surveys to really get the answer to see how much circulation is happening undetected. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, we have around 21 minutes or so left. So what I'm going to do is, um, and Kiara is feeding me some of these questions. I'm going to actually go back to you, Maria, and ask two questions, both from the Q&A. One is, um, are there any plans to combine the serial surveys with the mortality surveys to be able to better understand the mortality? And then related to that, I wonder if you could what I understand, uh, talk about the issue of in some settings, there in similar settings, you have high seroprevalence, but in where you'd expect to have a high-ish seroprevalence, but in a similar setting in a similar country or region, you have low seroprevalence. So there doesn't seem to be much concordance. Are you, can you discuss that and why that may be? Yes, so for the first answer, or the first question plans to combine sero surveys with mortality surveys, yes, um, as much as we can. So um, what we are trying to do is through our, uh, the unity studies that we're doing, we would like to be able to combine the results, pull the results from um, the studies that are population-based zero surveys. We also have zero surveys focused on health workers, on household transmission studies, um, on schools. And so if we are able, with the permission of the principal investigators, because the, the ownership of these studies is the countries themselves, to be able to pool those um, together with mortality surveys, I think that would be very, very helpful for us to, uh, to really estimate the infection 
fatality ratio and look at, at further estimates. There are a couple of good studies that are out already. Um, there's one, and I'm forgetting the authors, I should know this if I'm going to report on it, I think it's a preprint um, that looked at 45 mortality surveys and 15 seroprevalence surveys. Um, I believe London School was involved in this, um, looking at IFR, infection fatality ratio, and it, it varies drastically. Uh, because it depends on how this outbreak unfolded in each country. For example, in some countries that had high impacts in long-term living facilities, where you had tremendous and, and really devastating outbreaks in, in uh, old, uh, older living facilities, the mortality was much higher. There's a dramatic increase in IFR by age, um, and, and that is a consistent finding across countries. But yes, the, the, the long-winded answer to that first question is yes, and we will work on that. The second question around the, the discordance between seroprevalence results even within country um, is common. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are, are tracking this ourselves and we're looking at all of these studies that are coming out and it is quite discordant. Uh, a lot of it has to do with when, uh, which population was sampled uh, when the population was sampled. And most of the studies where we have results, this, the samples come from um, April, May, and June. There are actually very few that are uh, collecting, well, very few that have results where the, the samples are more recent. Our ideal study that we would like are longitudinal studies, which follow the same individuals over time. Uh, and second best are cross-sectional serial sampling of the same populations so that we can look at seroprevalence over time within these populations. This is absolutely critical. Almost all of the studies that are out are snapshots. And so this is really important and gives us a clue. It tells us that the world's, the majority of the world's population remains susceptible. Um, and that is the point that we have consistently been making in our press statements and in our public statements, and that remains true. But we do need to track this over time. Um, but I think it has to do with the way the studies are done, the assays that are used, um, there are uh, hundreds of rapid tests on the market. Uh, many of them are very poor quality. Um, and so uh, we need to have a better approach of the, the tests that are actually used, not to discredit the studies that are being done because I don't want to imply that at all. Um, but I do think we need to recognize that there are some limitations with the available uh, results that we have to date. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move to well, actually, all three then. I'll first, starting with Altoff and then Sandra and then Sean, I'm going to combine some of the questions. So Altoff, there was a, there's one question, and you, you hinted at it already, but um, in places like Yemen, is COVID, is COVID a considered amongst the population a serious threat relative to famine and every, all the other major challenges they have, number one? And then number two um, is relating to, and I know I don't know if this will be sensitive for you to talk about, but the politics where you have, um, as you mentioned, you're not getting results in, in the north. And this is not uncommon that in many parts of the world, um, some governments may not wish to report what they are seeing for various reasons. Um, actually, let's start with that, and then I'll ask Sean and uh, Sandra another question. Over to you. Sure, thanks, uh, Paul. So to your point where, uh, in terms of the, the population themselves, we obviously haven't seen the behavioral change, but obviously when we looked at some of the surveys that we've done through the um, um, C4D using UNICEF as a, as a vehicle to be, to be able to understand what is the retention of COVID-19, we've reached 26 million people. And what is clear is 26 million people within Yemen understand that COVID-19 is a public health problem where we don't see um, the reaction or the change is in their behavior. And whether that behavior is earlier onset presentation to the health system, because part of that survey looked at the fact that they have a lack of confidence within the health system. And a lot of this reverts prior to COVID-19. Um, in addition to it is what you alluded to earlier, is the authorities declaring and reporting. And I think I wanna make that distinction because there is a bit of a misnomer that, again, WHO serves as a repository for the declaring and the reporting. That is something that is reported through us through the international health regulations. And you see, when we talk Yemen, it's a very fragmented picture, north versus south. The southern authorities, uh, the internationally recognized government, are consistent in reporting. But I think, as, as Maria alluded to, those are the critical and severe cases. Those are the individuals that manage to come into the health system of course, is connected to our testing capability. One of the key critical factors 
in Yemen-wide rollout of COVID-19 was the capability to have sufficient tests, sufficient PCR capabilities throughout the country to be able to capture even beyond the critical and, and the, the, the severe cases. But to your point, in terms of uh, the reporting and the leadership, I mean, we have been very consistent as an institution and as the humanitarians wide saying that there is an obligation for you to report. And it's just not a box ticking exercise. I think we've all alluded to the fact, and Sean stressed this, that these numbers are critical for us to be able to drive where we are on the outbreak. You know, are we on the curve? Are we declining? Is there severity? I see there's questions of saying, is Yemen an exception? Number two is the population. The population feed off these numbers. And when leadership tells you, you have a problem, then they're more likely to be able to take measures to protect themselves, their families and their communities. And we did not see that. So the application of suppression measures, the application of mitigation measures, um, even the awareness was not there. And again, going into the fall where there's gonna be high seasonality of influenza, and we know that as you alluded to, pre-famine conditions, reminding everybody in 2017, Yemen had the world's largest recorded cholera outbreak in the world more than 1.1 suspected cases of cholera. Now we've gone very far from that and contained that outbreak, but again, cholera, very different from COVID-19. But the mix, to your point, with dengue, malaria, cholera, influenza, the population continue to have these exogenous shocks whereby they're saying yet again, another infectious disease. And you then complement this with their other public health problems. They look to the leadership, they look to the health system to provide them answers. Um, and this goes to the nature of the fact that it is a complex situation. It is an active zone of, of conflict. Um, and then, of course, um, I think what Sean alluded to, there are these small populations that have been shielded. And I think Sandra said this as well. Refugees, those internally displaced and those migrants did benefit from the shielding protocol. The question is, how long can we sustain that? Um, and so Yemen is, a, is again, I, I say a deep concern because a lack of robust systems. Um, again, Maria mentioned this, in the case of Yemen, birth and death takes place at home. To complement that, there's no formal registries. Um, and so to say it's complex is to do injustice to Yemen. And I think what we try to look at is prioritize the priorities, really just address the high course of morbidity, and then, and then try and create these solutions around that, whether it's yet another cholera outbreak, whether it's pre-famine conditions, whether it's food insecurity, and really just work with the authorities and the humanitarians large. And I think this is an accredit to the humanitarian community that they are holding and lifting Yemen to be able to make sure that they don't fall into famine-like conditions, to make sure that the health system, although 50% not functioning, wherever parts are available are offering services. Is it enough? By no means stretch of the imagination. And I think um, we continue to push the authorities even beyond the health sector. I think our director general has been very advocate a strong advocate for this and very clear to say that this is beyond the health system issue. This requires leadership at its core levels to be able to say, we have a public health problem. And we know that um, across Yemen, the concern was the health system wasn't uh, robust enough to take on the critical and the severe cases. The, you know, the, the heavy need for ventilation and then our change in therapy to oxygen uh, support, as well as the healthcare workforce didn't have the capacity to deal with this new disease. Um, so, you know, I paint a very bleak picture, and I think going to your question about models and where we're going, you know, you have to take COVID-19 into consideration with all the other public health and humanitarian needs that are in country, evoke some formal leadership across Yemen in order for us to be able to ta ta tackle this in the fall. Okay, thank you. Moving to Sandra, and it, this question could also be for, for Yemen and many other countries, but there's a question from um, some of the participants about deprioritizing, in a way, COVID-19, or what is suffering because we are focusing on COVID-19. But um, given the situation that, if it is true, that we are not seeing, uh, maybe we're seeing transmission, but not serious uh, mor morbidity and death, um, are we putting too much emphasis on interventions for COVID-19 and are other aspects such as maternal child health, mental health, um, actually being put more at risk because of the focus on COVID-19? Number one. And number two is, um, I think both you and then Maria also said that it's unlikely that you would have missed, because of the community uh, surveillance, that you would have missed an increase in death. Um, as Sean was saying in the ACAP survey, that they have been um, hidden. 
is that a possible do you feel that you're are you confident that you're not missing um uh very many deaths and that therefore there really has not been an increase in mortality due to COVID in these camps over to you Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, so in terms of deprioritization of other activities, we did have a, a lockdown of the camps so, and it was across different sectors. So this affected, um, let's say, shelter, for example. No, we had the middle of the rainy season and normally the rainy season is when you want to repair the shelters before and ongoing. So we had, for all the sectors, we developed uh, together with the different sectors and with the government, what are really critical activities, life-saving activities to make sure that they can continue. So in terms of, let's if you stick with shelter, this means, for example, we did blanket distributions uh, with plastic sheets and we replaced the houses that were totally damaged, but then, I had to rely on refugees to, to take on more of the burden for repairing things themselves. And what we have seen in terms when it comes to healthcare and deprioritizing healthcare, we have seen a decrease in consultations in general. There was not so much a matter of deprioritization from the health sector side, but it was a community perception that communities were very fearful, especially in the beginning, that health facilities are places where you can get infected with COVID. There was also the perception that if you are identified with COVID in these facilities, you will be taken away. There were a lot of rumors, including that people will not come back, that uh, people may be, uh, maybe even killed and so this this was much more a factor impacting actually health seeking and limiting so it was people limiting it themselves so it wasn't that the uh, actively reduced services the all the preventive services everything stayed open in healthcare the SRH services the vaccination services uh, stopped for for two months but that's the only one that was really uh, put on hold by the government so we had to do a lot of uh, trust building activities with the community and I found it quite interesting what Alkaf just said also when it comes to behavior change and how to overcome all these rumors and hurdles. So we had uh, shifted from I would say um, where are we now October, July onwards, July, August onwards to really emphasize once this first wave of uh, education on what is COVID, what are the signs and symptoms, infection prevention measures that you can take at home, then towards uh, restarting this, uh, promoting access to SRH services especially. And uh, we do see this coming up. What I found encouraging is that we, when we look at facility-based deliveries, this is one of the indicators that we fear the most uh, would drop. Uh, that hovered constantly around the same value of 55% throughout the years. Where we did see a lot of drops was where people deprioritized antenatal care, EPI, postnatal care. But these are slowly, slowly picking up again. But it does take a lot of time to re-emphasize this. And what Alfa said, I found really interesting, this behavior change. We found really that people know. They know quite quickly, but I think all of us kind of expected people will change their behavior quite quickly. And I think we expect too much in general from populations. And I think this is not only here, but also in European countries. I think we, we don't just tell people once, this is what you should do, and then we all adjust our behavior. If this would be the case, none of us would be uh, smoking, for example. And I think we, this is one of the lessons we had that we kind of expect. We, we tell people you should wear a mask, uh, you should distance yourself, you shouldn't go uh, and group in larger groups. This takes a lot, a lot of time to trickle down. And we have seen these changes uh, coming on. We have seen people coming back to the health facilities, but it does take incredible amount of time and effort from community health workers but also from other sectors to support this um, to ask on to answer also on your question about the missing deaths we we had a lot of discussions on this especially after the ACAPS report and did a lot of uh, additional investigations including over the last weeks we just um, finalized more investigations actually today with the WHO uh, colleagues together we we do think that slightly there are some deaths hidden. There are incentives for refugees to not talk about deaths. Um, there's always this fear that uh, if uh, community health workers know about deaths, it may be reported to authorities, meaning you get cut off from your food ration, you lose entitlements to the facilities. 
we, we quite strictly delink the two. We say the data that we collect are health data. They are not shared um, with other authorities as personalized data. We, of course, share numbers because they are important um, for reporting. But when we did a lot of uh, discussions with sector partners, with CHWs, with CHW supervisors, and really people say, you cannot hide huge amounts of mortalities in the camps. One thing we also have to recognize, the Rohingya community is um, a community that uh, where rumors also could spread quite quickly. You no, know, it's a camp and the rumor spreads like a wildfire. We have seen this in the initial phase especially. And I think this might also contribute to this uh, perception of deaths. And maybe just on the last point, if you permit me, just to in response to to the modeling, Sean, and what you had mentioned on where the models didn't work out, I think we were in a situation that's unprecedented. And for us, even the models didn't work out, they were extremely helpful because they helped us prepare for a worst case scenario. We didn't really know what we have to prepare for, what is the bad capacity that we should scale up. And the models really helped us to decide this is the number of beds that we need as a minimum. Even we were clear we would never meet the maximum that's required. But also then to look at, okay, so we will not be able to accommodate everybody. Let's look at home-based care systems and how we can support mild, moderate, and even severe at home. So just to really emphasize, although it didn't play out, it was extremely useful for us to direct us and to guide all the, the partners here in how we can respond in this really uh, difficult situation. Thank you. Uh, Paul, Thank if you. I just may very briefly talk about the deaths because I just wanted to say that um, even though uh, we may be missing some deaths, I mean, even though we are saying that you can't hide large numbers of deaths, um, this may sound like a contradiction. We are seeing huge increases in ex excess mortality in some countries. Um, across Europe, it's, it's dramatic. Um, and I think it, China went back and they looked at their data systems and they actually went back and looked um, at the mortality and they increased their numbers of deaths as well because people died at home. Um, and people are dying not just from COVID, but they're dying from other diseases because they can't access those health services. So I want to be clear. What, in my, what I was saying was that it's very difficult to hide large numbers of deaths associated with COVID-19, particularly in settings which are well managed, which are well documented, where there's good surveillance. But, but make no mistake, this is a very dangerous disease. This is a very deadly disease. And this is a controllable virus. That's the whole point, is if this were something where we had no tools, uh, where we could actually, you know, limit the amount of spread. Um, if we had no tools that could actually prevent people from developing severe disease and dying, that would be a different story. But we have those tools right now. And so I think um, the emphasis uh, and how what we're working at now is to try to calibrate our response to ensure that we don't put COVID ahead of everything else. We have to make sure that we do this, that we make sure that other medical services, all medical services are back online um, and that, you know, we can get businesses open, we can get schools open, we can have babies born safely and vaccines delivered. And that's the calibration period that we are in right now. And countries are really showing us the way to do that. But we're learning, you know, 10 months in, we still don't have all the answers. But how we respond to this, I think, is getting better. It's getting targeted. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, and not everyone is doing well, but there are reasons for that, which we know what those reasons are. So um, I just wanted to highlight that it is very dangerous. It remains very dangerous. And a you know, 0.6% infection fatality ratio may not sound very much, um, but that's pretty high, uh, incredibly high, much higher than influenza if it is allowed to spread. And it is very high as it increases with age. Um, but we have tools in place and, and, and you're hearing examples of the tools that are in place that are actually preventing spread and from saving lives. No, well, well said and um, it's important to emphasize that no, yeah, none of us I think here are, are talking about the issue of it not being um, deadly and that everyone has to take this very seriously. Um, I'm, I have two things. I want to move to Sean, but at the same time, Ryan, if you can put up the poll so that everyone can, we can do a re-poll and Sean, there are a lot of questions and, and I mean, thank you for everyone who've been sending them because there are so many good questions that we're never going to get to, unfortunately. But um, Sean, I wanted to ask you something specifically about the stochastic uh, effects of the, of the transmission and super spreader events. Um, and why do you think, for example, that we apparently have not seen or we're not aware of such events in, um, 
in some of these settings? And then how do you, do you think there's too much emphasis put on R not? So over to you and the reproductive rate. So that is a tough question. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, I, I think it's, it comes down to these events may have happened, right, in some of these settings, and we may just not have seen them. Um, it's really unclear at this point, and I think until we have um, good seroprevalence studies in some of these settings, we really just won't know. Um, it's possible that it's, you know, a combination of a lot of events or a lot of, a lot of things happening and combining in terms of, um, you know, testing and severity rates and reporting rates and all these things that makes it look like these haven't happened or maybe they truly haven't happened because of some of the measures that are in place. And I think this is, this is something that, that is really hard to answer right now. Um, as for the emphasis on R naught, uh, like R naught is, and the, the reproductive number is, is critical for understanding how transmission occurs, right? Um, and I think, but I think what you're alluding to is the emphasis on um, what it was initially coming out of studies from China, coming out of the US, um, and taking those estimates and applying them into these populations and assuming that these populations are highly dense uh and have less ability to implement control measures and so we assume that transmission is going to be higher or not it's going to be higher in these settings um, and that may be the case i think especially early on we didn't really have an understanding of how uh different uh, populations varied particularly you know maybe in the outdoor setting uh asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals transmitting potentially less uh, children p potentially tr uh, transmitting less. So it's not necessarily that we've overemphasized it. It's just that we have really not had a good grasp of what it has been in many of these populations. Um, we're over, so I'm going to say thank you to, to all of you. So Alta, Sandra, Sean, Maria, thank you. It's been very interesting. There's so much more to discuss um, and there's so much more to learn. So um, I'm just going to end by mentioning that the next webinar will be one month from now, Wednesday, November 11th, and the title is, it relates to what we were just talking about with Sandra, which health services in humanitarian settings should we not provide during COVID-19? These are meant to be provocative, of course, these titles. Uh, it will be moderated by uh, Professor Carl Blanchet of the Geneva Center of Humanitarian Studies. Thanks to our panelists, thanks to Reddy, and thanks to all of you who, um, who took the time to be here today. Much appreciated. Have a good rest of the day and evening. Bye.